This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Good morning and aloha. Welcome to Think Tech Hawaii's Law Across the Sea program. My name is Mark Shklov and I am the host of Law Across the Sea. Today my guest is Kai Wang and our focus is Chinese investment and more particularly the China-Hawaii economic road as I would call it. Kai is originally from China where uh, she went to school. She graduated from university there in law school, I believe. Law school. And she's presently an attorney with the Hawaii law firm of Carl Smith Ball, where she is a partner and chair of the Greater China Practice Group. For nearly a decade, Kai has worked in the Greater China region on cross-border transactions, in international law firms, and as an in-house counsel most recently, Kai served as Vice President and Regional General Counsel for Starwood Hotels and Resorts, where she oversaw all legal affairs within mainland China, Hong Kong, Macau, and Taiwan, and was named by a legal publication as one of the most influential and innovative general counsels in China and Hong Kong. Welcome, Kai. Thank you for being on my program today. Thank you so much, Marika. Um, thank you so much for having me here. It's great to be here. Well, uh, I've been looking forward to it. And I'd like you to tell me a little bit about your background and, and how you got to Hawaii and how you got into law, how you got into Hawaii. And then, then I want to go into Chinese investment. Right. Um, you had said it so well, um, <laughs> you know, through your really nice uh, introduction. That pretty much summed it up. Uh, um, you know, I first uh, came to Hawaii in 1994. Um, that was after my law degree, getting my law degree uh, in, in China. Uh, of course, back then, you know, it was uh, when I was young and uh, you know, always fresh eyes, I wanted to explore the uh, world. I was really fortunate to, um, to come to Hawaii. As they say, you know, my first step uh, into the U.S. Uh, uh, got me into paradise. <laughs> Um, so I spent two years uh, uh, getting my master in Asian studies, uh, um, and then I realized uh, uh, because I also had a, a law degree back in China, the best uh, career um, advancement or you know development might be to go back to law school. Uh, that explains why uh, I went back to law school. So I spent three years in Richardson Law School, got my Juris Doctor degree. Um, and you graduated here from our, our law school, and then you went to work at a local law firm. Right. I was really fortunate. Um, you know, I got this uh, uh, really good uh, summer intern, um, my second summer intern at Carl Smith Ball. Uh, and I was fortunate to get an offer and um, went on to become an attorney. I spent, uh, and then, you know, uh, made a partner. So I joined Carl Smith. Uh, my first time around, I should say, um, back in 1999. Uh, and I'm a partner in 2006. Wow. Yeah, Carl Smith, uh, I have many good friends there. Uh, Jerry Sumita, who's been on this show and is a good good friend and good good mentor to Jerry me. Jerry's a good friend. Yeah, yeah. So uh, you, you, you were at Carl Smith for a while, then, then you, you took a break right. from Carl Smith and you, you went back to China. Uh, you know, there are two nines uh, in my life. Uh, uh, at this point, uh, um, I worked for, I was with Carl Smith for nine years. Uh, and then I, um, I left Carl Smith for nine years, uh, and now it's a homecoming. I rejoined Carl Smith, returned to Hawaii. Um, Carl Smith is a great firm. Uh, as I said, it's, a, it's homecoming. It was my professional home. Uh, and, and you're back here in Hawaii. I was back here, yeah. Which is great, which is great. Nothing, right, nothing could be that. Uh, you know, we are the uh, oldest law firm in town, 160 years. So we're celebrating 160 years. So, uh, we're always a pioneer. We welcome the, the state's first female attorney uh, mm. back, I believe, in 1888. And now, you know, we're launching this. Uh, we're the first, you know, we're launching this uh, Greater China Practice Group. Yeah, now tell me w what you do in that practice group and, and how, how, how can you help people, especially those from China, who want to come to Hawaii or the United States? How, how do you help them 
get into business here or make investments? What, 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 what do you see as your role in that? Absolutely. Um, uh, with my experience, uh, uh, having worked and lived in Asia, not only China, you know, Hong Kong, Beijing, and Shanghai, mm -hmm. um, for the past, uh, you know, nearly a decade, really, uh, I have developed experience and skill, gained experience uh, to really act as the bridge for both communities. You know, I see, you know, the Chinese investor community as well as the local community. You know, when I see the local community, I don't mean just uh, the Hawaii community, but also the U.S., sort of, you know, the business community in the U.S. And uh, uh, more importantly, I feel, because, you know, for competent and smart lawyers, uh, um, there are so many. In fact, uh, you know, the U.S. is having an oversupply problem for lawyers. But I think, you know, what's uh, most important for us would be we have that uh, culture of fluency, the culture knowledge, the, really the cross-culture, bi-culture knowledge and fluency, um, so as to allow us, you know, this platform, my, my team back uh, at the firm, uh, to really act that as the culture translator for both business communities. Right, and you have come, you've come across the sea from China Twice, to Hawaii, twice over, <laughs> and then back, and then back again. Right. And so you you've had all that experience and all that background, and and now now you're looking forward to what what's going to happen next with our relationship. And tell me, what is going to happen next? What is the relationship? What's the economic mm -hmm. relationship between the United States and China from your point of view? From my point of view, uh, I think you know we're living very exciting times. So. Um, Never before seen, uh, you have, uh, I mean, I count myself really fortunate to be able to witness, uh, uh, you know, the transformation. Uh, primarily, you know, the transformation comes from the China side. Yeah. Um, but uh, I, I do see, you know, great potential, great, great possibilities for the bilateral trade, you know, between China and the U.S. to flourish. But again, you know, uh, it takes two to tango. Um, I think, you know, China is ready. Ch China is uh, willing and, uh, you know, they, over the past four decades, uh, they've gone through essentially a economic miracle. Uh, they developed that capacity, that um, deep pocket, <laughs> or, you know, the desire to come out. Um, but right now, you know, it seems that the U.S. is having a slightly closing door policy. Right, right. I mean, we have uh, President uh, Xi on one hand and uh, President T on the other. Right. And uh, the, there's a lot of money in China, mm -hmm. uh, uh, a lot of m millionaires being developed, uh, and they're looking, I think, for ways to spend the money. And where, I mean, what, what is, is it, or do we have an open house here in the United States? There's a, let me just say, you know, there, there's a void in, uh, in, on the sort of international stage uh, through, you know, an anti-globalization sentiment a little bit. Um, unfortunately, you know, in this country, um, there seems to be a void uh, left uh, at the international stage. Uh, but I think, you know, China is ready to, uh, to sort of seize that opportunity to so come on stage. China's ready. China's ready. And, and we hope that they will be received here in the United States. What, what, what type of investments are the Chinese out there looking for? What, what, you know, you, you, have, you have a lot of money. Right. And uh, you're looking for investments outside of China. And I want to ask you why, but what type are, first are they, are they trying, to, right. trying to find? You know, we, we, we have so much to talk about. But let's, uh, for now, in response to your question, let's focus on, you know, the, sort of the sector's survey. Um, and then I, I have to start with, uh, you know, chi Chinese investment in figures, in numbers. So, um, we're just looking at uh, the last uh, 12 years, you know, starting from 2005 all the way to uh, 2017. Um, China had spent a combined uh, 1.6 trillion USD. We're talking about, you know, ast astronomical figures. Yeah. We're talking about USD. Um, but you know, in both M and A acquisitions as well as construction, um, 
some people would say that you you manage the construction because that's not a equity investment, right? You know, that's a service providing. But still, you know, even if you manage that, it's still a large figure. And uh, 2016 really saw a record year of the uh, merger and acquisition activities. Uh, globally, you know, we're talking about more than 200 billion USD. That's how much mm -hmm. they've spent. And, uh, uh, you know, when it comes down to the US, uh, um, last year alone, US was able to, to attract 55.6 billion. Uh, and uh, 55 billion, or 50 billion of the total, you know, money coming into the US actually went to the real estate market. Mm. That includes both uh, mm -hmm. uh, commercial real estate and residential real estate. So we are sort of you know zooming in uh, to the um, U.S. situation, but globally, in terms of uh, different sectors, uh, you see a evolution. You know, over the past uh, sort of twelve years, uh, you see a evolution. They uh, started out uh, uh, prompted by the government's uh, going out policy mm -hmm. um, by acquiring or you know looking into uh, natural resources, energy, uh, utilities, uh, that started out as uh, really the desire to stockpile, you know, natural uh, resources. Uh, but then, you know, as the um, domestic economy uh, evolves, um, they are going through right now a uh, sort of upgrading process for the economic model. So they are sort of, you know, you will see there's a migration from the energy utilities uh, manufacturer driven um, focus uh, uh, to this uh, consumer based technological hmm. um, you know media entertainment more towards lifestyle and and that uh, first round of investment going out looking for uh, resources I guess right. mm -hmm. it, it, that was before P President Xi that was before and it uh, pr primarily uh, sort of you know focused on Africa you know continents such as Africa and uh, Europe mm -hmm. and we saw you, you mentioned that there was a lot of real estate investment now is that uh, can you is that a cultural thing or is that a, 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 a w w what is the reason for that why are why is that yeah, a, a big you. big investment uh, thank you, Mark, for identifying that. Uh, <laughs> I think you know that uh, qualifies you to be half Chinese. <laughs> um, I think you know it's in the, in the dirt, uh, in, 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 in the blood, and you know for um, for Chinese to to buy dirt. Um, you know they have one one point four billion people at home, um, and the size of the country is uh, actually slightly smaller smaller than the U.S. And uh, uh, the density, you know, in po uh, population. Uh, so psychologically, I think you know, if you if you look at the Chinese psyche, um, they gravitate towards uh, real property, something mm. more tangible. Um, but you know, there is also an economic reason for that, uh, especially in tier one cities uh, such as Beijing and Shanghai back home. Uh, um, the property market, you see. Uh, has uh, skyrocketed I mean, in terms of price. Ah, so now they're looking outside the United States, I mean, outside of China, in the United States for maybe a better, better opportunity. Bargain, right. Ah, that makes a lot of sense. It does. So that actually leads to a lot of, uh, you know, uh, uh, reasons, uh, rationality behind um, this uh, uh, shopping spree, you know, so to speak. Uh, some people call, call it an outbound shopping spree you know, by uh, Chinese investors. Mm -hmm. so, um, primarily, uh, I would like to narrow them down, you know, all the drivers, into three different drivers. So the first one, of course, is, is a you know, political driver. Um, there is a concept uh, that, that's been touted by uh, President Xi ever since uh, um, he um, started his first term. Um, and uh, th that was back in 2013, so five years ago, four or four and a half, uh, five years ago. Basically, you know, he, uh, he launched, uh, coined this, this term called a Chinese dream. Chinese dream. Chinese dream. Okay, now I want you to wait. Sure. And we're going to take a short break. And then I want you to tell me what the Chinese dream is. In the context of the drivers. Yes, yes. Absolutely. Uh, okay. My pleasure. All right, so we'll take a little break and then we'll be right back. Thank you very much. Thank you.
thank you. Kindness. Pass it on. A message from the Foundation for a Better Life. I'm going to the game and it's going to be great. Early arriving for a little tailgate. I usually drink, but won't be drinking today because I'm the designated driver and that's okay. It's nice to be the guy that keeps his friends in line, keeps them from drinking too much so we can have a great time. A little responsibility can go a long way because it's all about having fun on game day. I'm the guy you want to be. I'm the guy saving money. I'm the guy with the H2O and I'm the guy that says, let's go. Welcome back to Law Across the Sea. Uh, my name is Mark Shklov, and today I'm here with Kai Wong. And we're going to talk about the Chinese dream. We have talked about and we've heard about the American dream. Now, Kai, what is the Chinese dream? I'd like to know what that is. Sure. Um, it was, it was uh, um, almost like a counterpart you know, to the American dream. But it differ in so many ways. So, um, the rationale behind, you know, uh, the launching of this idea by President Xi Jinping uh, was really to, I mean, the central objective is to better the living standards of Chinese people mm. um, and also to uh, develop the country economically so that China would be able to, to play a rather central role uh, on the global stage. While, you know, there's also a deep culture sort of relevance to that. Um, as opposed to the Western idea of uh, um, democracy or, uh, you know, uh, um, I guess human rights. So, so they wanted to develop uh, this uh, reverence uh, to Chinese traditions, uh, you know, under the Confucian teaching. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. essentially, um, in my mind, uh, it differs with the American dream in that Chinese dream in, in the minds of the government is actually well going to be, is going to be facilitated by the government, by the state, by okay. the nation state. As opposed to the individual in the United States. That was so pronounced in the um, American dream uh, philosophy. Okay. Yeah, please go on. Sure. Um, essentially, you know, they, um, as a political driver, um, I think I mentioned this before, uh, you know, there are different uh, legitimacies uh, to justify the existence of a regime. Um, so, you know, talking about uh, uh, around 1949, uh, that was pretty much a charisma-driven legitimacy. Mm -hmm. You know, Mao. right. Relying uh, solely on the charisma, you know, of Chairman Mao. But uh, for the uh, subsequent generation of leaders uh, in China. That's uh, 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 not there. That it just wasn't there. So they relied instead on the so-called performance-based legitimacy. Performance meaning economic growth, uh, the ability to bring well-being to the people. Um, there's a deeper, actually, culture um, tradition in, in that. So for many people, they view um, you know, China doesn't have the um, check and balance system, mm -hmm. but you know, it, there there has always been one. It's just it's different from the uh, sort of a three different branches of the government uh, uh, that's in existence in the sort of Western political civilization. Back back in China, this idea of a mandate of heaven, you know, was uh, first uh, uh, developed by one of the major disciples of Confucian. Mencius, both uh, uh, of the um, sages actually uh, are from my home province, Shandong. I'm enormously proud well, of that. That makes a lot of, of sense. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, the, the idea of mandate of heaven is really, it's a vertical, you know, it's a, it's a vertical accountability. Um, essentially, um, for a ruler, you know, for, for ancient uh, dynastic emperors, uh, they have to carry out what is called mandate of heaven really to you know, uh, benefit the people, uh, service the people. And uh, if they are not doing a good job, you know, the people, the, the mass, the, the general populace out there, um, they're entitled to overthrow, overthrow the dynasty. Mm. So it's essentially a, sort of, you know, a vertical uh, 
sort of a check and balance system. So that's a that's a different check and balance that I've learned about today. It and was rather volatile. I mean, you know, revolutionary. Yeah. Uh, so that's essentially to maintain that um, legitimacy. Uh, Chinese government has to ha has to. Um, I wouldn't necessarily call it a global expansion, but they have to uh, develop the economy. And so that actually leads to the second driver, which is the, the business driver. The business driver behind this would be, um, you know, over the past four decades, they had gone through this uh, economic miracle. Uh, they established, I mean, they were able to accumulate all that public wealth as yeah. well as, as, you know, private wealth. Um, in the, uh, within China itself, uh, they've experienced uh, sort of uh, limitations, overcapacity, um, limited return. As a result of that, they have to come out. They, in order to compete with uh, you know, global giants uh, like uh, you know, Samsung, uh, Amazon, they realize they have to, even for like, uh, enterprises, it you know, doesn't matter whether it's a state-owned enterprise or private enterprises, in order to build that globally known brand, they needed to come out through overseas mergers right. acquisitions. Yeah, and they, they, they need to show their face outside of China. Absolutely. And, yeah. Okay. And also, you know, diversification would be a good rationale. Um, and as uh, China's currency RMB is uh, devaluating, they needed to find, uh, they needed to sort of diversify their portfolio to also include assets that's denominated in a stronger currency. Makes a lot of sense. You know, it makes a lot of sense to see the insight that you've given into the, 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 the reasons why China is, is moving outward right. and, and making these investments. And, and there's one more driver. What's, what's that? The last but not least you know, driver, so, so, you know, so to speak, is the human factor. Um, wow. As a result of that economic growth, uh, um, they were able to accumulate uh, uh, so much wealth. Uh, you know, a few figures. I think you know um, they have uh, over the past uh, uh, five years. I think they have accumulated like 165 trillion. That's in RMB, okay. private wealth. Uh, and if you look at a Forbes list, uh, uh, China has the most, uh, if not uh, the most. Uh, I mean, overall figure is probably number one. Uh, you know. Uh, the billionaires, you know, of course, you know, Chinese women, right? They, China has the highest number of self-made uh, female billionaires. Wow. I'm talking about self-made, not through marriage, not through inheritance. Um, so they have to spend all that money. And, you know, over the past uh, uh, how many years, uh, um, and also for so many generations, they've been so deprived. So it's time for them to come out, to enjoy you know, the final things in life, to really live life to so Good opportunity, fullest. good opportunity. Absolutely and that kind good of re opportunity. That really explains it for me and, uh, and it gives me a good, good background and idea of what, what's happening in China and actually uh, takes it a little bit beyond the government and party to me uh, and a little better understanding. Uh, now, now, let's say you have a Chinese client. What, what, are, what do they, you know, they, they come to you what are my problems? What should I do? I want to make an investment in the United States or in Hawaii. Right. What, what generally would you, would you tell them? Um, I would say that you know, the newer generation of Chinese investors, uh, uh, they are savvy. Uh, they're really smart because they've gone through, um, they've seen so, so much uh, back home. Um, of course, mm. you know, there are limitations. Uh, um, it's hard to uh, portray a single dimensional sort of, a of prototype uh, Chinese investor because you know they're really all over the map. Mm. You're talking about institutional investor, you're talking about private investor, individual sovereign funds, uh, SOEs, state-owned enterprises. Uh, they all demonstrate uh, uh, different traits. Uh, but once uh, some of them uh, language for, for some of them language is not an issue. Uh -huh. They hire the best management team. Uh, you know they hire the best talents. Uh, so, but you know for some for others uh, language. Uh, you know you need to uh, try, sort of you know uh, to help with communication. Um, so that's just uh, the linguistic uh, uh, dimension. 
Uh, but then there always comes the culture translation dimension. So when a Chinese investor, you know, Chinese client comes into the door, um, most most often, I mean, it's already too late because uh, they don't realize how important it is to seek assistance, uh, you know, Prepare. from legal professionals uh, until they have signed a deal. Um, so that's so the biggest problem. That they is should really contact you before they ever start absolutely. moving forward. In the legal and regulatory system, uh, in environment, uh, it's so different yeah. from back home. Uh, so it's vitally important for them to really surround this. You know, I would, if there is one single advice to the investors, to the Chinese investors, really is to surround yourself with the best team. It could range from legal, financial, you know, communications, technical advisors. So, uh, that's the best way to learn from the best. Now, with, with respect to Hawaii, uh, what are we looking at in Hawaii? Do we have Chinese investment here? Is it, is it a good thing for Hawaii? Do we want more? Do we have any advantages just being in Hawaii? Is, 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 is Hawaii a good place for Chinese investment? Um, Lo lots of questions. <laughs> Let me try to break it down. <laughs> uh, yes, it's real. You know, we, we do see uh, lots of Chinese investments. So let's look at the data one more time. Um, over the past 17 years, you know, from 2000 to 2017, mm -hmm. apparently, you know, there are a total of nine deals taking place in, in, in Hawaii um, with a total value of 890 million wow. USD. Uh, of course, compared to you know more attractive destinations so, such as New York and California, it's really small. Mm. But the sort of uh, uh, conversely, I mean, you know, on the other side of the coin would be, uh, I see huge opportunities. So. Okay. And number two, it is a good thing. I mean, I could spend all day trying to convince everybody it's a good thing. But uh, I think the most important thing I've heard is uh, from. Uh, uh, one of the salesperson I encountered at Ala Moana Shopping Center, she just nailed it. She said, I think it's a good thing. They are putting money into Hawaii without t taking away jobs. Mm. Um, I, I think, you know, that's a really common sense, straightforward, Saxon way of uh, summing it up. Um, in terms of uh, the future, um, let's, talk, you know, let's talk about uh, Hawaii, what Hawaii has to offer. The, you know, so to speak, the advantages of, of Hawaii. Um, I see so many. Uh, number one, you know, cultural similarity. It's, a, it's Asian, uh, predominantly Asian uh, sort of oriented uh, in terms of value, population, the way we do things, uh, this kind of community. Um, number two, you know, much better climate, beautiful place, rich uh, tourist tourism resources. And uh, number three, as I mentioned, you know, they haven't uh, invested too much into Hawaii. That translates into potential. Right, right. And, and now they have somebody who knows about them and can help them. And I, I'd like you to leave us, if you would, with some, you have a Chinese proverb. I love proverbs and sayings. Do you, you have something that you could uh, give us that will perhaps give us some guidance into the future? Absolutely. Um, I do have so many, you know, my favorable, favorite uh, uh, Chinese proverbs. Uh, but, uh, but I thought, you know, for today, um, I'll, I'll focus on this one uh, four-character proverb. It's called um, 上善若水. Um, the strict translation is the, the best of men is like water. Uh, it can also be translated into the greatest benevolence is like water. Uh, I was rather uh, inspired by my idol. You know, if uh, there's a certain thing called my idol, that would be Bruce Lee. Um, I was watching this interview Bruce Lee given. Uh, he was talking about, uh, you know, the power of water. In, uh, you put the water into a cup, it becomes a cup. It, it could crush, it could flow. It's uh, shapeless, but it can also penetrate. It's rather powerful, yet it could be gentle. And it's also a common denominator of all of us all across the world. It's an it? it's a agent for life. Yeah, it cultivates yeah. life. Yeah. Well, Kay, Kai, thank you so much for being my guest today. I, I, thank we, you. It was 
you, I learned a lot from you, and I appreciate the opportunity to talk with you. Vice versa. It was such a pleasure. Thank Al you. Aloha. Aloha.